Uh, it's funny, I was actually just explaining to uh, another friend of mine, one of the big projects I've been working on over the last year, I don't know if we talked about it or you saw in, in, in looking into me at all or anything, but uh, we're about to finish with the oral history of Comic-Con. And um, uh, we've been working on it literally since pandemic. In fact, I was already developing it before pandemic. I was originally going to go to San Diego and LA and even maybe uh, Washington, where some people are who worked on Comic-Con in the early days, to do interviews in person. And then all of a sudden, we had to do it all remotely and everything. But I've, you know, I've almost kind of lived in this kind of major Tom, David Bowie, uh, escape pod this entire time, not only focusing a lot on this particular project, which has been a nice distraction from everything else, but <laughs> also a lot of people don't realize this, but Comic-Con has been around since 1970. And so and a lot of the people I talked to are well into their 70s and 80s. So we were talking about... Twilight Zone and Lost in Space oh, and uh, all these things from the 50s and 60s, Mad Magazine and all this. So in many oh. ways, I've been kind of cloistered in this like protective bubble of nostalgia. Uh, so my my COVID year was much different than a lot of other people's. We did unfortunately lose some people and, um, you know, certainly I was impacted by certain things with the political stuff and everything else like anybody. But uh, I did have this kind of extra barrier of sort of this pro this Comic-Con project. And I was just talking with a friend of mine earlier today about it, how, how interesting it is now that we're almost done with it and we're going to be launching in late June, that uh, that was what, when, I, when I'm telling my grandchildren about COVID, it will be a lot about Comic-Con. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. It's a uh, click steen with a K. So click, click like the sound click and then steen. Really nobody knows for sure if it's steen or stein like most uh, immigrant Jews. Uh, my family's name was changed at Ellis Island a couple generations ago. And uh, yeah, you know the drill. And also I actually asked my grandfather at one point before he passed and he didn't even know if we did. That was his answer actually. Um, I read uh, Tom Wolf has this very interesting and particularly timely book right now, even though it came out in the 70s, called Radical Chic. I don't know if you're familiar. Um, but uh, he said in it, Leonard Bernstein said that Stein is the Jewish, Stein is the Americanized. So uh, I guess that's one way of putting it. And I always thought that was interesting. When I was much younger, I would go by Click Stein because I was weirdly obsessed with Frankenstein. I'd always dress up as Frankenstein. I think I had a bit of a connection because of the name. I was really into old movie monsters when I was a kid. Uh, in fact, uh, a school librarian and a teacher of mine, I think in third grade, had to have a discussion with my mom about the fact I kept taking out these books that they had about old mo monster movies, like, you know, the, the classics, really. Bella mm -hmm. I was probably the only third grader in America who knew who Bella Lugosi was. Um, and Boris Karloff and Lon Chaney Jr. And the, and the teacher and the librarian were a little worried that I was so obsessed with monsters. And my mom said she told them, wait, you're, you're bringing me in from work because you're worried that my son keeps reading all these books and is interested in film history. And they kind of looked at her and they're like, yeah, I guess you're right. So my mom was like, yeah, I don't know what that was all about. But anyway, <laughs> and then later on, it became Clickstein. I think part of it is my dad says Clickstein. And so I'd always hear him say it. So I would say Clickstein, but I was, I did change from Clickstein to Clickstein at some point in my life. So, and I also later learned that my name really is spelled with one T uh, when I was getting my driver's license. Uh, that is true. My mom had me in my house. My mom's an interesting woman, as you can tell already. My mom had me in my house because she's always, she's been deathly afraid of hospitals and doctors. I was vaccinated and the whole thing. She's not that crazy. But we did, I, I was a home birth intentionally. So she had a midwife and the midwife apparently misspelled my name on my birth certificate. And when I tried to get my driver's license, it caused all these problems. And I learned that my name, uh, 16, I'd been spelling it wrong for 16 years. And indeed there's only one T in it. And it was, by then I already knew I wanted to be a writer professionally. I was already writing a lot and such ever since I was 12 or 13. And I remember thinking, well, this will be a way to make my name a little less common because I always hated that I was always Matt K because there was always another Matt in the class or wherever I was. So at least it was a way. And then I later learned there actually is another Matthew Clickstein uh, who's obviously related to us. I've never met him, but he's like a third cousin or something in Brooklyn. He's a few years uh -huh. older than I. So I am actually glad that I went with that you know, and, and stuck with that as my professional name or whatever, yeah. because there's another, and he's actually a musician too. So he's in the creative ah. as well. So right. it's good that we don't get mixed up that way. That's probably one of the reasons why is because I have the one T. 
I, I know I, I'm rambling like a crazy person, but I will say that one other uh, addition to that is when I was much younger, like four, five, six, yeah. and was very precocious, surprise, I was certain my name was spelled with three T's and my mom could not convince me otherwise. So indeed, if you look back at some of my childhood books, my parents seen bears and so forth, where I'd put my name in it, I would spell it with three T's. So it was Matthew with three T's and she could not convince me otherwise. So I went from three T's to two T's to one T and from Clickstein to Clickstein. How so long that, did those three T's last? How many years? Um, probably until I was around six, I think, and was more socialized in the classrooms and that kind of thing. I also, until first grade, thought that the year started in September because that was when my birthday was and that was when school started. Yeah. And I remember learning that the year begins anew in January and, and really being confused by that because it was like, well, wait a second, my birthday is September. We start school in September. That's when the school, that's when the year begins is with my birthday and with school starting, not with January. That's weird. So it took me a while to understand that January was the start of the year. <laughs> oh, I love that. I love that story. Now, so what is it, six, six or no, seven years later is when you wrote your first novel after the three teens. I wrote, I wrote my first novel when I was 13. That was an interesting story too. Um, you know, I know I ramble quite a bit, but oh well. Uh, no, it's I, you don't. It's fascinating. <laughs> um, I was one of those people who just knew as soon as I can remember that I was going to be a writer. So I always loved books. Um, both my parents were very well read. Both my parents were very artistic. There was a lot of art in the house. And it's funny because my dad was a salesman and my mom was a dental hygienist. And then when I went to college, she went back to school and became a therapist and focuses mainly on drug and, and alcohol rehab. So neither of them did anything in the arts at all. Um, I really, none of their friends were involved in any of the arts or anything. I really didn't have any um, actual rubrics for people who were real artists or writers or movie makers or anything growing up, even though I did grow up in Southern California. Um, so it wasn't really a part of my life. I think because of that, though, I never saw it as a business. I just did it for fun. And I was one of those kids who we would do play. My friends and I would make plays and we would do it for like five people or our parents or something. Like when we would get bored, we were, you know, we definitely did stuff with the cardboard box. The cardboard box would become a spaceship and the whole thing. A lot of that was because we were also all really into Calvin and Hobbes. And we kind of learned that, that a little bit from Calvin and Hobbes. But my friends and I growing up in my neighborhood and, and in my school, we were really creative together. And we just, and we would record radio shows and we would do it on little tape recorders. And then a little later on, we would do it on the computer and we would do sound effects and things. And some of my friends were trying to get into music as well. So they would have musical instruments and things and uh, 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 cameras. And then of course people started having video cameras and then we started making short films. And, we would do the thing of cutting it on the VCRs and the whole deal. So I just, a lot of my childhood was creativity and we just all read books and we watched movies and we were very interested in the behind the scenes of television and such. We would read books about Looney Tunes and Chuck Jones and things, fifth, sixth, seventh grade. I mean, really young getting into it. And for some reason, I sort of became the writer of the group because I just wrote really fast and I wrote a lot. Um, I would just do it for fun all the time. Uh, and now, I have a question. I mean, if you wrote that novel when you were 13, did you have a bar mitzvah at the same year? No, I actually, uh, I, I like to say I'm Jewish only on my parents' side. I've, <laughs> I've, I've been to one bat mitzvah in my whole life, never a bar mitzvah. And I only went to that one bat mitzvah because I was right. I was a senior reporter for the Jewish Times in Baltimore. And someone thought it was probably a good idea for me to go to an actual bar mitzvah for a bat mitzvah. Um, Bloodwise, totally Jewish, both parents, both grandparents, on and on and on. I've been always been involved in different Jewish organizations since I was younger. I like the people, the culture, the community, the history, the heritage, but never been religious, never raised religious. And so, no, but just to wrap up the story about the novel, yeah. um, uh, my mom, I did watch a lot of TV and played a lot of video games as a kid too, until I was about 12. And around the same time, I stopped watching TV so much and completely stopped playing video games. Um, and I just grew dissatisfied with them both. And I uh, remember very specifically just realizing how, what a waste of time it was spending so much time watching TV and playing these video games. 
And around the same time, my mom suggested that I really like writing. Why don't I try to write a short story or something? So for a class, I think I was at still 12 at this time, I wrote a short story, a science fiction short story, and uh, it was 17 pages. And even as a 12 year old, I realized, wow, that's pretty good for a 12 year old. Turn it into the teacher. She really liked it. She said, you should expand this. So I turned it into a 35 page short story. She really liked that. And then that summer, I kept working on it. And indeed it turned into a 350 page book that I finished right around my 13th birthday. And um, I was not bar mitzvah. I sent it to one or two people that we knew through friends of friends of friends of friends at like Simon and Schuster, I think, and one or two other places. And it was a lot of, you know, either no response or I think, you know, we're impressed that you're so young, but you know, you might want to take some workshops or things. And it was definitely a mess of a book, but you know, then I wrote a few more in high school, like it sort of became my summer thing. I just really enjoyed it. I would work, of course, summer jobs and I would do other things as well, right. more normal kid stuff. But my hobby, especially since I wasn't really watching TV anymore and I completely stopped playing video games was I would work on my books. And it was just yeah. something I did for fun and I really enjoyed it. And then ended up going to uh, screenwriting school at USC uh, right. for college and then everything went from there, so. And then at 21, you worked for the National Lampoon Network? I did. A lot of people don't even realize this. I've yet to meet anyone who remembers this at all, that this existed. So people probably think I'm making it up. But for a brief time uh, in the early 2000s, National Lampoon had its own TV channel. And it very smartly was piped into colleges. So you would see it at a, uh, at a cafeteria or at the gym. I think some of the dorms would get it. Um, it was kind of a precursor to like a collegehumor.com or a funny or die. Uh, it was very, you know, comedy central kind of base and very simply some friends of mine and I, a few years older, uh, we put together this show that was, uh, David tells insomniac. I don't know if you remember the show insomniac with the comedian David tell, but he would go around in different cities around the country and kind of have one part travel log but it was also sort of comedic so it was kind of like a funny version of Anthony Bourdain or at that time kind of like a, um, a Rick Steves or a Hewell Hauser type of thing and we we pretty much ripped the idea off but did it at college towns with a host that we that was involved in the show and the way that things worked out with it we got the phone call that we were going to go to air the same day I was graduating from college in fact my family was in the living room while I was on the phone in my bedroom finishing up some things and then I went to graduation and of course was waiting in line with everyone else that, oh, I'm going to Europe, I'm doing this, I'm going back home. And when it came to my turn, it was like, yeah, I'm, we're doing a TV show for National Lampoon. <laughs> so, but no one's ever heard of National Lampoon Network. No one's ever heard of our show, College Town USA. It's never come up. It did not do anything for my career. I still had trouble even getting PA work afterwards. And we really, I mean, I had to figure out how to make a TV show on the road. And it was, and it had to be fast, by the way, because we'd be out for a week on the road. We would send the material to our home office where our other friends were, not National Lampoon. It was all like outsourced. They would edit it and then it would air the next week. So every week we had to keep getting enough stuff so that the editors could edit it and so that it could air the following week. It was a marathon. And I was 21. A couple of the other kids on board were, were 20, a few of them. I think the oldest person was 25. We And we went to Santa Barbara. We went to UCLA. We went to Berkeley, of course, you know, that kind of thing. All California schools to start with. The entire crew split after the, the first season was done because it was just too crazy. Yeah. And, and the next few seasons, they went to, you know, ASU and stuff like that. Of course, some of the more obvious like party schools and whatnot. But it was a wild experience. And uh, yeah, yeah. But I was definitely disappointed and frustrated that at 21, I made my own TV show with some friends for National Lampoon and it still did absolutely nothing for my career. And <laughs> it's not ever come up in any conversation except this one. <laughs> well, he said, well, I loved National Lampoon when I was growing up. And when I saw it, I went, oh, how cool. Because I remember the, you know, the magazines and the, the, the sure. movies and this, that, and the, um, but now what was your first, what would you consider your first big break was? Um, my first, that's a good question, actually. Um, I had done a lot of journalism work and some movie and TV work and whatnot. Um, actually, I was going to say one thing, but really it's probably another. By accident, truly by accident, I wrote Steven Seagal's uh, one and only horror film for Sony Pictures when I was 23. Um, 
you know, it's one of those situations, and I've talked about this in a few other interviews specifically about this because it was such a funny situation. But anyone who knows anything about Hollywood now or then or back in the earliest days or whatever knows it's a pretty kooky, crazy town. Uh, a lot of reasons why I left uh, in, 20, in 2009, around the same time that this all happened. But so my script definitely was changed around. I was not intending on making it a Steven Seagal movie. Let's leave it at that. Um, but it, it was a script that I wrote. It was purchased by Sony. It was supposed to be something completely different, turned into a Steven Seagal movie. Uh, you know, still made a nice little paycheck, especially for somebody in his early 20s. And it's a fun icebreaker sometimes at parties or meetings that I wrote Steven Seagal, not only a Steven Seagal movie, but his only horror film to date. Uh, <laughs> so, and for Sony. So uh, that, but really the one that I'm most proud of, and that was most my, it actually was what it was supposed to be, was after a few other smaller books and some journalism, and whatnot, I did get to write a book for Penguin Random House about the history of Nickelodeon. And uh, I yes. spoke to 250 people who were involved uh, in all the different shows and at the network. And, um, you know, that was also a Herculean undertaking. I mean, it, it, yet again, I really did not know what I was doing at first. I was still relatively young. I think I was 29, 30 when I first started at all. Yeah. So I, I was not a baby and I had done a lot of journalism work and some documentary stuff. But to put together a book like that was much more challenging and complicated than I thought. And even I think the publisher, because originally their original deadline was three months. And I said, there's no way I could put this together in three months. They gave me six, but even that was still, I mean, there were a lot of 15 hour days there, like, especially toward the end. I mean, I'd go to bed at three in the morning and put my alarm on for 7 AM. And I mean, it was just all day through. And I think I ended up with 3000 pages of notes. I had to have a number of friends help me with transcriptions because yeah. One of the deep, dark secrets about the publishing world and really media and entertainment general is you really do not get the kind of budget or money that you think that you're going to get, especially when you're working with a large company. And that's been the case with almost every project I've ever worked on, even to this day. Um, creatively, I'm usually quite happy with the teams that I work with at these big companies, but financially, it's really, really difficult. And I could go much deeper, and I have, about my concerns about what that means, not only for me, but for the kinds of people who can make art and journalism, because in a lot of cases, you better be financially settled if you're going to spend a year or two years or three years or four years on a project that you might get a few thousand dollars for, and you need that money to travel and for his, you know, resources and to help pay people to help you transcribe interviews and so forth. And so that was a bit of a rude awakening when I was working with Penguin Random House and just you know, they gave me a lot of support in a lot of ways, but financially things were tough and time-wise things were tough and I just kind of had to do it. And as you may or may not know or remember, there have been a lot of documentaries and other books and magazine articles and things about Nickelodeon over the last few years, of course, with all the 80s, 90s nostalgia stuff. But at that time, there was really nothing. And so not only was I figuring out how to do a book at that scale with very little money and very little time, uh, but also I had to kind of piece together the, the story of Nickelodeon itself because I hadn't really been done before. I had no rubric to work off of. Mm -hmm. um, so that it also was very challenging, but somehow I did it. It came out. It was a big success. We got to do a lot of really cool events. It's one of the things I'm kind of known for even to this day, eight years later, we did a fifth anniversary edition for it about two or three years ago. That was kind of fun. And uh, through that, I met a lot of really great people too, including Mark Summers, who I ended up working with on some of his shows and we did a documentary about him a little later so it definitely was probably my my first really big thing and absolutely changed the trajectory of my life in a lot of ways well i remember i mean uh, today i was looking on the internet and i saw you because i know that you you had an event that sold out 900 seats yeah and yeah. it was produced and co-moderated by you and I turned I was looking and I think I that was it that I turned it on you probably saw the thing yeah it's it's up there we did it at this amazing space in New York uh that I didn't even realize at the time what a big deal it was it's called the 92nd Y mm -hmm. and I mean it's where they have you know not not to put myself or certainly a book about Nickelodeon on the same pedestal but it's where they have you know Pulitzer Prize winners and you know Academy Award winning actors talking about their careers I mean I, when I found out of that we were going to Penguin did help with getting that space which was great um, I certainly couldn't afford you know to rent it for the night or anything else um, but uh, when I found out about it I was really excited but it wasn't until later that I learned what a prestigious and amazing space that is uh, especially in in New York City and in the kind of art and literary world, um, and I and I did work my butt off to put together an event that I thought would be something very special, 
Um, and, uh, you know, we were able to get Mark, of course, to be the host. And I was able just through talking to get, yeah, about 40 Nickelodeon people to come out. Um, many of them uh, were flying out from LA or other people. A lot of people were already in New York, but a lot of them came on their own accord. And uh, that was extremely generous of them. We could not pay them. I could not pay them. So they were, they were paying to fly out. They were paying to stay in New York City, which is not cheap. Uh, you know, food, everything else. Uh, it was a little chaotic. It was a little crazy. I was making deals right and left with Guitar Center for equipment because we wanted bands and music. I really wanted it to be this very special experience and event. And luckily it went off without a hitch for the most part. I, you know, we had no idea it was going to be that big with the fans. He had 900 people came. Mm -hmm. uh, the 90 second Y actually afterward told me they'd never had something like that happen, both with the number of people who came and just how elaborate the show was with live music and all, you know, we, we had multimedia stuff. I got videos made. It was this full thing. And, um, the good news was it went really well. The not so good news was, as anyone will tell you after an event like that, we didn't sell too many books, but we did sell some. Yeah. Um, that was the only way I was getting any money out of it. And even that, you know, I don't get money until the advance is met, which will probably never happen. Um, and uh, also yet again, you know, I've done and I've tried to do other live events and things over the years and I've gotten to do a few other things. But once again, I was kind of surprised that that didn't really lead to another larger thing of that level for me. It's like, I almost feel like every time I do a big event or a big book or a big documentary, you know, it goes well, things are great for about three weeks and then I have to start all over again. And to be truthful, a lot of big people that I've interviewed or talked to or worked on books and things with have said the exact same thing. They're like, as soon as you are done with your last project, you might as well be no one for the next project. There's very few people who can kind of snap their fingers and get their next project going. Uh, and even a lot of people who you would think it would be easy for, it's still very, and I know some of them, it's yeah. still very, very difficult to get their next project off the ground. So it's a very fickle, weird industry, entertainment, media. Yeah. I, you know, I don't, I, I, I've been working in it for 20 years now. And I know some of the biggest names in the business. I've worked with them. I've written books with them, documentaries with them. And they would say the same thing. William Goldman is right. You know, nobody knows anything. And at the end of the day, it's all a big crapshoot. So <laughs> it's a nutty world to live in, to be sure. Uh, well, you know, and, and I, I was picturing again, you up on that stage and you were great, you know, as, you know, interviewing everybody and the energy in that room was like, you know, and I, I didn't, I haven't watched the whole thing yet, but I was like, I gotta watch more of this because I was watching, I started like, it's like, it was, it was really, sometimes you go to these interviews, you know, especially in, as you know, in Hollywood, they have, the cast and sometimes it's sort of like oh another one of these but even with that it, the energy came through that the, the screen yeah it, there was a lot of energy in the room and one thing that i i you know i hope anybody would be checking it out would understand knows once again this really was the first time that anything like this was done with nickelodeon there had been a few other kind of smaller individual cast reunions with one or two of the other shows um in, you know in places like chicago and whatnot but this was the first time that we brought it all together like this. And I can tell by the fans and even, you know, I was behind the scenes through all of it. Um, I, I could tell even a lot of the people who came who were old Nickelodeon people, they had no idea that this was going on, that this was this big. In fact, I'll never forget um, uh, Connie Shulman, who was the voice of Patty Manny's on a cartoon called Doug. She was also, she's been in a lot of movies and TV shows. She's been in some Woody Allen movies. She was the yoga lady on the show, Orange is the New Black, which I've never seen, but a lot of people told me she was on that. If you saw her, you'd probably recognize her, but I remember her walking by me to the stage when I was uh, behind the scenes for a second. And she actually went like, this is a nightmare. This is insane. I had no idea it was gonna be like this as she was walking by. And a few of the other ones had said some of the things, no one call it a nightmare per se, but Ross Hull, who was uh, a character named Gary on a big show called Are You Afraid of the Dark? Kind of the Twilight Zone of Nickelodeon. He came out from Canada and actually made a little short film while he was in New York about him kind of learning and realizing what a big deal Nickelodeon fandom was that he did not know. So he ended up actually even making a little short film about it. And a number of the other people, like they really did not understand or know that there was such a love and nostalgia for old Nickelodeon. And I've, ne I've never been told this from anyone at Nickelodeon or anything like that, but I'm quite certain that that night and my book at least really helped to kind of remind Viacom and Nickelodeon and probably a lot of other people in Hollywood and media that there is a real 
interest in Nickelodeon because um, there just had not been something like that yet before. Maybe it would have happened anyway with all the 80s, 90s nostalgia stuff, but we were right there at the beginning. Yeah. And I'd like to think that that night, especially because it was at New York City, it was, you know, it was this big prestigious space. So I know that there were a lot of people in the crowd who were from various TV channels and and whatnot. And I've even met people over the years who, who, who later they told me, you know, I was there that night. And it's like, oh, I didn't even, you know, so it was one of those events that I think a lot of people were at who probably went back to, you know, their magazine the next day or their bosses at whatever and said, hey, we need to look into Nickelodeon stuff because there's something going on here that we're not talking about yet. So, but it was a pretty wild, crazy night. I barely, I pretty much blacked out. <laughs> I, I remember very little of it. My mom, my mom actually flew out from California to come. And she said afterwards, she was in the elevator with my grandma and actually broke down crying because she was so nervous for me at first. I had never before since done anything like that. I used to do a lot of public things. And even when I was younger, I would do talent shows and such with stand-up comedy and things like that but never for 900 people, never before since then. And I don't know if I'll ever have an opportunity to do something like that again. But, you know, I remember just being in this trance state. And the one thing I remember thinking is, because you're on the stage, a lot of lights in your face, so you can't really see out there. It really was like there was this black void that I was talking to. And to my right was, you know, Mark Summers and some of these other people that we were interviewing. And over my knee to the left, was a black hole that I had to every now and then remind myself is 900 screaming people. Uh, so I was able to kind of be in this Zen state of not really thinking about it. I was really focused on my interview and because there were so many people that we were interviewing and talking with and interacting with and so much stuff was going on. I was focusing on that yeah. um, instead of the crowd. <laughs> Jumping into it. Well, what's so wonderful about you too is I mean, I was looking at you, number, by the way, your website is gorgeous. I was saying, oh my God, I think I need to read my website. Well, thanks to my wife. My wife did that. Becky Clark, she did a great job. Gorgeous. It's gorgeous. Oh, and by the way, you said Becky. And then I, I remembered writing down uh, David Foster Wallace, adjunct professor. Is that, that's your dog? Our dog's name is Adjunct Professor David Foster Wallace. Now, I want to be clear for anyone who's a fan of Mr. Wallace's work, the late Mr. Wallace's work. He's not to be confused with, uh, you know, the actual Adjunct Professor David Foster Wallace, who has since passed. Uh, oh. Just, it's as a coincidence, uh, our dog's name is also Adjunct Professor David Foster Wallace. So, just a wild coincidence that that happened. Yeah. But uh, yeah, um, actually my, my wife, when she was in the hospital today, uh, she had some minor work that she needed to get done, but she brought with her Infinite Jest because she's been reading it like a lot of people for the last three years or so. Uh, and uh, you know, a big nice book would be good at the hospital. And she said it, it really, there were a lot of conversations over the, the, the book, how big it is, what is it, all this stuff. She brought up the fact that our dog's name is adjunct professor David Foster Wallace. Uh, the anesthesiologist was a big fan of David Foster Wallace is the writer, not our dog. Um, right. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so it's That's so your next book about your dog. <laughs> yeah. You have so it's many good. books. I mean, I, I, oh my God, I could talk to you for hours. Uh, one thing I wanted to ask is what, how, why did you decide to delve into arts therapy? Mm -hmm. How did, how did that come about? You know, I, there's two answers there. Uh, one is ineffable. One is inexplicable. For some reason, I've always just had a real connection with uh, people with disabilities, with outsider art, Jean Dubuffet, and, um, uh, you know, Eleanor Glennie, and, and different musicians who live with blindness or deafness, and filmmakers, and uh, at a very young age, I was very interested in Marley Matlin's work and Children mm -hmm. of a Lesser God. I used to read um, Of Mice and Men over and over again. Uh, when I was 11, I actually was the special ed teacher assistant at my junior high school and was fascinated, not only enjoyed just the work of, of, work of helping out in the class, but I really enjoyed talking with and working with these different people with disabilities. They all have very different wants. Um, and, you know, it was, it was really engaging for me. Um, and I just stuck with it. And uh, I've had friends and even one or two girlfriends in my life who've had severe disabilities um, as well. And, and it's just kind of always been part of my life and my community. Uh, so the first answer is, I don't really know. I've just always had a connection with people with disabilities for whatever reason, my interest uh, in them and their work and their history and, and them as a community 
um, and as actual individuals as well, of course. Um, but secondly, I think there's a relationship to a lot of what I was just talking about with Nickelodeon and with some of the other work that I've done, which is it's a lot about outsiders and misfits and kind of the, 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 the I don't want to say downtrodden because that's, that's sort of more depressing or, or sad or pathetic, but it's, that, that's not how most people I know with disabilities are. In fact, most of them are the exact opposite. Um, but more of just the people who are kind of forgotten, disenfranchised, left out of the story, left out of the picture. I've always had a real connection with people like that. And so aside from my interest in persons with disabilities um, and arts therapy over the years, I also have had a lot of interest, even in the, the uh, books and documentaries and other projects that I've worked on about other groups of people or, or other organizations or persons that really do focus a lot on kind of fringe community, fringe populations, populations. The fact that when I was working on the Nickelodeon book, no one was really talking about old Nickelodeon shows and that even the people on the shows didn't realize there was this community that had sprung up over a generation of people that were so um, you know, fanatical about them. It was, they were quite literally forgotten in a lot of ways. And so I've always had this interest in that. And you know, even again, when I was younger because my mom was a hippie, you know, I was well aware of who the Beats were and certain things about the punk rock community. And um, I got really into Riot Girl before a lot of people my age had and, and, and so forth, just because I was so fascinated in hip hop and just communities and groups of people who were sort of self-creating and self-perpetuating. And, you know, a lot of people that I've met over the years who are persons with disabilities also happen to be very creative because I tend to work again at art therapy places or with the band, the kids of Whitney High, right. um, things like that. So, and they're, they're making their art and they're expressing themselves in ways that um, a, a lot of other people can or won't because not everyone does live with blindness or deafness or certain mental um, differences or whatever it might be. So they truly physically have a unique perspective that's so fascinating to engage with, especially when it comes out as music or art or writing or movies or books or acting or whatever it is, which I've had the pleasure and, and you know, the, 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 the generosity of them to work with me on um, to let me into that world. Uh, but also, again, the fact that there is kind of this community, especially that's been growing over the last couple of years, of recognition for that in film and television and media, which is so important, as we all know, especially right now. Um, and it's been wild and fascinating to be a part of that process and to see it growing and to see what's happening, to see a movie like Crip Camp get nominated for the Academy Awards. Uh, I can't um, wait till, yeah. yeah. So, um, and just to, to, to see that, know that, and watch that happen. Um, has been great to kind of ride along as on a sidecar here and to do what I can to help um, however I can and bring my connections, bring my resources, bring my own personal talent and skills and experience to the table and to work with groups like the Kids of Whitney High or a group in Denver called Family or the Sprout Film Festival or just individuals and friends of mine over the years all over the country with disabilities who are working to tell their story or to um, you know, to, to act or to make music and such. I just really enjoy it. And I feel like there is beyond the community of persons with disabilities, there's kind of a community of outsiders, misfits, people who might not necessarily fit in with more of a mainstream uh, population in a way. And a lot of persons with disabilities would probably count themselves along with that. A lot of persons with disabilities probably would not. Um, right. And I know a lot of people with disabilities who don't even like to be associated with it at all. 